Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the radio ministry of Twin City Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or on the web at cicministry.org. This is Dick Kuffel, your host for the next half hour. We're speaking today with Bob DeWay, pastor of Twin City Fellowship and author of Critical Issues Commentary. Our topic today is The Problems with Personal Words from God, Part 2. Bob, could you give us just a little bit of a recap on what we covered last week? One minute's worth. Last week, we talked about categories of knowledge. And we talked about the secret things that belong to God that he has not chosen to reveal, the things that are revealed, which are in Scripture, and then general revelation, which is anything that's accessible to normal knowing using our five physical senses and our rational mind. And we're saying general revelation, fair game. We have to learn that or we die. Okay, yes. we couldn't even survive on the earth. Special revelation, that's what God gave us. That's the Bible. Secret things God has not chosen to reveal that can't be gleaned from general revelation are forbidden. And we're saying that these personal revelations that people claim to get fall in the category of secret things. Okay. Now we come to the second and third portion of your paper. Its title is Becoming a False Prophet to One's Own Self. What does it mean to prophesy? Well, to prophesy is to speak authoritatively for God. All right. Is that a good thing for everybody to do? Well, it is if you do it according to the rules. That's okay. true. In other words, if you take special revelation, Scripture, and you see a decision to make, and there's something that applies in a binding way to that decision, the moral guidance of the Bible, then you're properly prophesying. Is it an example of that, 1 Corinthians 14? Yes, and we've written about that in other articles. And that's something we can do for ourselves. Yes. If we're trying to decide a course of action, and we find a scripture that would say that it would be sin to follow that action, then that is, in a sense, prophesying to ourselves. We're saying, here's what the Bible says. If I do this, I know this to be a sin. Therefore, God says, don't do it. 1 Corinthians 14, in your paper, you make a, just a brief note that it says that we're to do things unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. Right. And Anything that's doing that out of Scripture is a good thing to do. Exactly. It applies. It applies in a binding way. And we always talk about implications and applications. Exactly. Okay. And that's where we find our guidance. Okay. Now, what about personal words from God? Well, here's the problem again. They don't fit that category. If we claim to have heard a word from God that he gave in order to direct our lives beyond Scripture, then we have to put it to the test of prophets. Yes. Is it inerrant? Is it infallible? If we can't believe that it is, but we nevertheless speak it to ourselves and obey it, we become a false prophet to our own selves. You know, I love that implication, application discussion we've had, you know, many, many times. Well, we're doing it right now. How? I'm just, I just did it. Okay. I just said God's spokespersons have to meet certain tests. Yes. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 13. Yes. We talked about it last week. Yes. When we say to ourselves, God is saying this, we become a spokesperson. Yes. For God. Yes. No, so they may say, no, 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 God did that. No, you're saying God said it. Yes. So you can say God said it to the church, and we'll have an illustration to show why, why it's like I'm saying, or you can say God said it to yourself. You're still speaking for God. Okay. So a valid application of an implication of Scripture is that you've become a prophet to yourself, and if you're ever wrong once, you're a false prophet to yourself. Excellent. That's good. And so, in a sense, I'm prophesying right now. That's true. Okay. You make a comment, just to the next stage of this, is that it's a sin to bind what God is not bound and to loose what God is not loosed. Binding and loosing. Apply it here. Let me give you an illustration. All right. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. And let's see if we can't make an application to our discussion. Okay. This passage is 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. I'll read it. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience 
as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. All right? (laughs) Wow. Now, it says here that to forbid marriage is a doctrine of demons. It does. It says it clearly. That's correct. And to forbid the eating of certain foods. Yes. Is a doctrine of demons. Yes. Now, let's apply this to our personal words from God. If someone spoke to the church and forbade marriage in God's name, everybody could see he's teaching a doctrine Doctrine of demons. demons. That's right? right. But what about if it's not to the church, it's to him own self? That is, somebody prays and says, well, God told me that I'm to remain single and that I cannot marry. Same thing. Is it not a doctrine of demons if he speaks it to himself, but it is if he speaks it to the church? Wow. I don't think you can make that. That's not a valid application. Wow. Or an implication. The the valid implication is you're still teaching a doctrine of demons. You're just teaching it to yourself. Correct. And this is a very kind of argument that Luther used against the monastics. Yes, he they did. took a vow to never marry. Yes. So they made themselves above God's holy word and they spoke a vow that God did not ordain. Amen. They taught themselves doctrines of demons, swore to it, and then took an oath to confirm that they would continue to walk in this doctrine of demons no matter what. Let me give us another category, Christian liberty. Yes. It isn't saying that you have to marry to avoid a doctrine of demons. That's where I was going to go. What if I choose not to? You're free to not marry, but don't claim that you're not marrying in God's name because God told you you cannot. And don't take an oath to it, because what you're doing when you do that is you're binding God in a way that he hasn't bound you. Amen. In other words, God's providential will may be that he wants to use you married. And he might bring a wife into your life, but he can't do that because you told him he can't. (laughs) Amen. All right? So this isn't that hard to understand, but it flies in the face of what most people have been taught most of their Christian lives. Absolutely. There are very few men or women that are bringing this out, what we're talking about right now. But one of the excellent ones is Gary Gilley. Mm. He has a book out now called, Is That Really You, God? That takes the same position that I'm taking. Oh, really? Yeah, very well done book. And we're having him speak in November of 2008 at another one of our Faith at Risk teachings. Looking forward to that. Yeah, so Gary Gilley and a few others have published some books. But most people haven't thought long and hard about the implications of their claim that they're hearing God's voice. Your final paragraph in that section said, Therefore, personal words from God that are taken to be binding and authoritative, whether given to the church or one's own self, are false. And the final line in that paragraph was your advice to us. I I said people that do that should quit listening to themselves. (laughs) I thought that was If you're speaking to yourself in God's name beyond Scripture, don't listen to yourself. Isn't it interesting, though, if you bring the gospel to somebody, very often the first thing they think of is what they can't do. Yeah. Well, look at this doctrine of demons and food even. You can make the same thing. What if somebody came and said, God told me not to eat pork? Yes. That's not valid. Yeah, been there, done that. You're teaching a doctrine of demons to your own self. Yes. But you're free. You're free to choose what foods you eat. Just don't do it in God's name. Exactly. If you choose not to eat pork, that's fine. That's within your Christian liberty. We talked about that when we taught through Romans 14 on the radio. Remember the one who eats vegetables only? Yes. They're right. free. Yes. The one who eats pork? Yep. He's free. Don't bind things that God hasn't bound. Okay. Now we have to shift to another subject. All right. And it has to do with the difference between special revelation and providence. Here's yeah. your comment. There are those who teach that personal words from God are to be the normal experience of all Christians. They often write literature where biblical characters are used as an example, and they use Moses. Now, what do you do with that? <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, I've seen that. Some Oh, see, Moses went in the tent of meeting, and God told him what to do. Mm-hmm. We just did a whole seminar. I did a whole hour, and we have a DVD on this from our How do we really hear from God's seminar? Yes. I did a whole hour on that because some famous teacher came out with this idea that everybody can have their own tent of meeting and go get their own revelations from God like Moses did. 
but it's a, a total trashing of what the Old Testament actually taught because people that claim God didn't speak specially for Moses, he could just as well speak to them. People like Miriam, like Korah. Miriam got leprosy and Korah dropped right into hell. Uh, Joshua guarded the tent of meeting so nobody else could go in there. God chose Moses as the mediator of the old covenant and as the lawgiver. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and the lawgiver of the new covenant. Everybody's not Moses or Jesus or Paul. 